Hello, my name is Randy Golden. My name is Gerald Roy. My name is Roger Heward. My name is Lee Finnishan. My name is Gordon Barnhart. Municipalities of Saskatchewan. Central Region Director. Vice President for Towns. Northern Regional Director. I'm the President of Municipalities of Saskatchewan. 14 years ago. 24 years ago. 14 years ago, I became a municipal councillor. Oh, I became a councillor for the city of Yorkton. I became a councillor in the town of Salt Oh, I became a municipal councillor. And I chose to run for council because I truly believe it is the most rewarding way to make a positive uh, impact in my community. I wanted to help our community be the best that it could be. Because I wanted to work with other like-minded individuals to have a positive impact in my community. I wanted to give back to my community. Have you thought about running for municipal council? Municipalities of Saskatchewan is hosting free virtual sessions for anyone interested in learning more about being on a municipal council. Visit the Municipalities of Saskatchewan website for more information. Hello everybody and welcome to part one of the Municipalities of Saskatchewan Candidate School Series Governance 101. I apologize that part of that video was cutting out. We were having a little bit of technical difficulties, but no worries. Um, if you wanna watch that video, you can find it on our Facebook page, on our Twitter, or live on our YouTube page. So make sure you check that out. I know many of you have already seen it as it's what brought you here to today's session. Today's session is going to be recorded and it will be provided to you in the coming days along with a link to register for part two of the governance sessions the city, town, and village hall sessions, all coming up next week, September 8th, 9th, and 10th. Join us for your chance to ask your burning questions about council operations to real counselors and administrators from communities across Saskatchewan. And if you can't make it to that session, you can register to receive a recording of the webinar for later viewing. I wanna thank you all for attending. It's great to have you here today. We have over a hundred people on the call and we're really excited about that. Uh, we're going to start today's presentation by asking you to fill out the following poll. Will we get the slides pulled up for today's presentation? So if you just wanna take a minute, it should be popping up on your screen here right away. Uh, and then you just need to click on the multiple choice questions uh, and hit submit. And while we're doing that, I'll ask our presenter today, Judy, if she could pull up the slides. Uh, and if you're having any difficulties, Judy, just let me know and uh, we will get it working for you. Okay, I am assuming that nobody can see my slides. Uh, not yet, Judy. All right, it's showing on my screen. So Sean, I may have to have you show yours. Uh, no problem. Um, and you hit that share screen button at the bottom, Judy? Yeah, I sure did. Okay, um, I wonder, there's a, once you are done clicking through that, there is a, a little blue button that says okay or share. Um, just try clicking on that first. Yep, there we go. Okay. Um, so, perfect, let's... yeah, we're just seeing your desktop and now it's pulled up. Okay, so everybody can see it? Yep, perfect. So we're just gonna finish the introductions. The polls are all done. I wanna thank everyone for filling those out. Uh, my name is Sean Whiskar. I'm one of municipalities of Saskatchewan's advocacy advisors, and I'm now gonna give you a tour of Zoom. For those that don't know, municipalities of Saskatchewan has exclusively been using Zoom for the last year, and it is our preferred platform that we really like. So if you're lucky enough to become a counselor, you may find yourself on our webinars uh, using Zoom in the future. You have your audio settings at the bottom left of your screen. And if you're having any problems with the audio on your computer, you can always switch over to listening in through phone audio. You have your Q&A for questions. Please note that you have the choice to send your questions anonymously and that the questions can only be viewed by us, the panelists. You have the chat for the comments and conversation. And I've seen many of you are already in there telling us where you're from. And if you haven't done so already, drop a comment and let us know what community are you from? We also have the raise hand function, which is gonna be used by us if we're having any technical difficulties or need any last minute feedback. I wanna offer thanks to our webinar sponsor, Brownlee. Thanks to Brownlee's sponsorship, we're able to offer this session to you today for free. I'm now gonna hand it over to Michael Sullivan uh, from Brownlee, who's going to bring greetings. 
Well, thank you, Sean, and good evening to everyone that's joining us uh, on the call here tonight for Municipal Governance 101. As Sean said, my name is Michael Solowin. I'm a partner with Brownlee LLP, and uh, our firm is uh, proud to be partnering with the municipalities of Saskatchewan uh, as part of Central Source's preferred legal provider to municipalities. If uh, you're not familiar with Brownlee, uh, we are a full service law firm that has been providing legal advice to municipalities, municipal corporations, and uh, related municipal entities for over 85 years in Western and Northern Canada. Uh, we're always proud to support uh, efforts to bring further education on local government and local governance. And uh, we're happy to be part of the session here tonight. If you are thinking of running for council and, and aren't very familiar with what a municipality is, you're gonna learn tonight that municipalities are a form of government and a corporation. And you can imagine that uh, as our, our municipalities uh, continue to grow and get more sophisticated that their legal needs uh, are also evolving. And so at Brownlee, we provide advice on such matters as planning and development, labor and employment, um, contracts, construction law, public procurement, uh, council governance, access to information and privacy, real estate, and contracts, uh, among many other services. If you're elected to council, uh, we look forward to uh, working with your uh, local council to help bring um, legal issues to the table and provide you the best advice that we can. Um, so I hope you enjoy this evening's session and I'll be sticking around for the evening uh, to join in any uh, Q&A at the end of the evening. So once again, on behalf of all my partners and associates, uh, students and staff at Brownlee LLP, uh, we're really proud to be uh, with you tonight and to sponsor this event, so thank you. Thank you again, Michael, and uh, we look forward to what you're gonna be able to add at the end of today's presentation because uh, having a lawyer on the call is really going to build on to uh, what Judy is going to present on, so we're really excited to have you. Uh, without further ado, let's start the presentation. Uh, Judy Kanak started her municipal administration profession in 1984 as the assistant administrator for the RM of Spalding. She became an administrator in 1988 for the village of Quill Lake and the RM of Lakeside. After a fulfilling career there, she joined the advisory services team with the Ministry of Government Relations in 2017. In her spare time, Judy enjoys reading, golfing, and spending time with her friends and family. So without further ado, I'm gonna let Judy take it away. Uh, and Judy, feel free to uh, turn your camera back on if you'd like. All right. So first of all, thank you very much Sean, for inviting me to participate in this webinar. So my goal today is to provide you with some key information I better flip to my uh, screen. Here we go. I want to provide you with some key information about municipal governance in Saskatchewan. Now we're just going to touch on the highlights of governance because truthfully, we could discuss this topic in detail during the course of an entire day-long session if we had the time. This presentation has three components to it. There's the foundations of municipal government, the roles and responsibilities, and procedures. The information will hopefully be beneficial to anybody considering running for council, and of course, for those incumbents that are consider considering running again. So let's begin with the foundations of municipal government. We will cover municipal purpose, municipal services, and the authority to govern. Municipalities Act is the provincial legislation that creates municipalities, and it also provides the legislative framework by which to govern. Now you're gonna hear me talk about the Municipalities Act in uh, various ways. I may say the Municipalities Act, I may call it the MA, I may call it just the act, 
or perhaps legislation. And for the purposes of this presentation, if I talk about legislation, that is what I'll be referring to as the Municipalities Act. So what are the purposes of a municipality? First of all, to provide good government, which basically means decisions are made that affect everyone in the municipality. Provide services and facilities that council feels are necessary and desirable. Develop and maintain a safe and viable community. To foster economic, social, and environmental well being. And to provide wise stewardship of public assets, which basically means protecting the financial interests of the municipality's infrastructure and other public assets. So, municipalities have what's called natural person powers. And what that means is the municipality has the same privileges as any natural person has and can therefore exercise actions that are not necessarily explicitly set out in the legislation. So for example, levying taxes. That is not a natural person power because the authority to do so is in the act. And you as an individual cannot tax another person. Another example would be the power to pass bylaws. That is not a natural person power. Only municipalities have the power to pass bylaws. So on this slide, you can see some of the different services that municipalities are responsible for providing to their citizens. Most people are familiar with those. So the Municipalities Act sets out a municipality's powers and duties. There are two very important words that are used extensively throughout the Act, and they are shall and may. Shall obligates a council to act, and when it says shall, that is a non-negotiable obligation to council. They must do it. For example, council shall conduct their meetings in public. May, on the other hand, empowers a council to act. For example, council may conduct their meetings electronically. They can choose whether they want to do that or not. So they can use the may um, feature, I guess, at their own discretion. But if council does use their discretionary authority, they need to be prepared to answer the question why, if any of their voters wants further information as to why they chose to make that decision, because the Act also says that municipalities are accountable to their electors. Decisions must be made by resolution or by bylaw. Legislation does not provide council members the authority to act or make decisions individually on behalf of the municipality. But to put this in context, a member of council who makes a purchase for the municipality that has not been authorized by council might be held personally liable for that particular purchase. So let's move on to the second half of our presentation. We'll talk about the roles and responsibilities of council members, of the administrator, and of the public. But before we dwell into that and look at the major roles as they relate to municipal government, I thought it'd be a good idea to take a look at this organizational chart. Now in this example, the public is at the top. Municipal council, including all of their boards and committees, if any are established, are accountable to the public. The administrator reports directly to the council and the foreman and the staff report to the administrator. Now this is just one model. There are many out there that exist and the one that's used by your municipality is ultimately determined by the council. Legislation does not describe exactly how a municipality is set up other than stating council is accountable to the voters and council must appoint an administrator. There's a lot of information available on municipal governance. 
and it often discusses the drawbacks of elected officials becoming directly involved in municipal operations. In fact, the Act explicitly says that a council member cannot be an employee. Neither can a council member act like an employee. In other words, doing a job that ordinarily an employee would be responsible for doing. When we hear of a municipality having trouble, perhaps with staff or with the public, the, co the cause is often attributed to a weakness in this organizational structure. So it's very, very important for everyone to understand everyone's role. So all members of council have the following responsibilities. They are to represent the public and consider the well-being and interests of the municipality. They should participate in developing and evaluating policy services and programs for the municipality. They must participate in council meetings and council committee meetings. They must ensure administrative practices and procedures are in place to implement the decisions of council. They want to keep in confidence the matters discussed in private or that will be discussed in private or closed sessions. We'll touch on that in a little while. Council members are expected to maintain the financial integrity of the municipality and perform any other duty or function imposed by any act or by the council. Basically, council is the decision maker for all matters pertaining to the municipality. It's not a council member's job to get involved in the day-to-day -day operations. Leave that to your staff. The mayor basically has the same duties as all other council members with only a few limited additional ones. And those would be chairing council meetings. That's the mayor's responsibility. The mayor also has the ability to call special council meetings. And the mayor is responsible to be the head under Local Authority Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. And because that's so long, I don't want to say it again. We often refer to it as LFOIP or just the privacy legislation. Another thing to keep in mind for mayors, the mayors must vote on all resolutions at council meetings, just like everybody else does. Uh, there's a myth out there believing that the mayor is just simply the tiebreaker, and that is not the case. When elected to council, each member of council is required to complete an oath of office or an affirmation of office, and that has to be signed before they begin their term. This is a prescribed form that must be completed. And what it requires is for all council members to declare that they will perform their duties truly, faithfully, and impartially, that they are indeed qualified to hold office, that they have not or will not receive payment or reward for any uh, corrupt practice, that they have read and understand the code of ethics, and the rules of conduct and procedures, that they promise to perform the duties of office, they'll disclose any conflict of interest, and will comply with the code of ethics and rules of conduct and procedures. So I mentioned earlier that one statement in the oath, oath is to declare any conflict of interest. This is where the public disclosure statement comes into play. The public disclosure statement will identify the employment, the financial interests, business interests, and property holdings of a council member and the council member's immediate family. The public disclosure statement must accompany the nomination paper when running for office. It must be completed again uh, within 30 days after being elected. There's also an annual declaration to complete in future years by November 30th of each year. In addition, if a council member has any change um, occur on the public disclosure statement that he has filed earlier, he will also be required to amend that notice within 30 days of any of those changes happening. Public disclosure statement 
is publicly accessible. All right, so when we talk about conflict of interest, it's important to understand that it can and is even likely to exist. However, its existence in itself is not evidence of a wrongdoing. What matters is how a council member handles a conflict of interest. Process for council members to handle a conflict of interest can be summed up in these five steps that you'll see in the yellow uh, box on the screen. First, declare that you have a conflict of interest, and that's before any consideration of the matter. Secondly, disclose what the conflict is and why and how it might affect your impartiality. Then you will abstain from voting on a decision or a recommendation or any action for that matter that council is considering about that particular matter. Refrain from participating before, during, and after any discussion on the matter. And I just want to re-emphasize those words before, during, and after. Again, there is a myth out there that a conflict of interest needs only be declared at the time of voting. And that is not the case. Um, you should be declaring and following all five of these steps before any discussion even begins. And lastly, the council member should leave the room until all discussion and voting on the matter has finished. What's well, important to remember that any matter that comes before council that involves you and you have listed it on your public disclosure statement, that will automatically be a conflict of interest and you should be declaring, disclosing, abstaining, refraining, and leaving the room. It is each member of council's individual responsibility to follow the process for handling your conflict of interest, starting with the declaring. It is not the responsibility of fellow council members, nor is it the responsibility of the staff. If a contravention occurs, it can be handled under the municipality's code of ethics bylaw, which we will discuss next, or through the legislation and the courts under the section regarding disqualification. So the Code of Ethics Bylaw essentially defines how council members are expected to behave with each other, the employees, and the public. It addresses such standards and values as honesty, which means council members must be truthful and open, objectivity, meaning that decisions must be made carefully, fairly, and impartially, impartially, didn't pronounce that word. Uh, respect, and that means respect for everyone, including other members. Everyone must be treated with dignity, understanding, and of course, respect. Transparency and accountability. This means council business should be conducted so that citizens will be able to clearly see how and why a decision was made what information, advice, and consultation perhaps council has considered, and which legislative requirements were followed. The Code of Ethics Bylaw also discusses confidentiality. Confidential information that is gained while in office must be kept private. As a member of council, you should not benefit from information you've learned in fulfilling your role as a council member. Leadership and public interest is about serving your citizens in the best interest of the municipality, which will also build the public's trust and confidence. Responsibility means acting in accordance with the legislation, disclosing a conflict of interest, and following the policies and procedures of your municipality. All Saskatchewan municipalities are required to have this code of ethics bylaw and the process for handling alleged contraventions. Now, as mentioned in the earlier slide, if a conflict of interest was not handled 
correctly, a complaint can be filed under this Code of Ethics bylaw. So let's tie it all together. Public disclosure statements are a mechanism for the public to hold their elected officials accountable and to ensure that the right decisions are being made in the best interest of the municipality versus their own interests. Council member has a conflict of interest for everything listed on their individual public disclosure statement. The Code of Ethics bylaw and the legislation requires that you declare all conflicts of interest. This may also include conflicts not on your public disclosure statement. When you decide to run for municipal office, you accept the duty to act in the municipality's best interests, not your private or even perceived interests. There will likely be a time sooner or later during your term of office when a matter is before council which you have a conflict of interest in, and that's perfectly okay. Just remember to handle it the proper way. So the administrator's role includes providing financial management, advising council on legislation and operational matters, and providing the overall administration and management of the municipality. Administrators must be qualified under the Urban Municipal Administrators Act. If not otherwise provided for by council, the administrator is the person responsible for hiring, suspension, and dismissal of all municipal employees. Administrators are expected to remain impartial in their role as advisors and to ensure that decisions made by their council are carried out. In addition to the act, an administrator must be aware of any other legislative requirements. The municipality relies on other statutes for some of their activities, such as the Planning and Development Act, the Uniform Building Accessibility and Standards Act, the Tax Enforcement Act, the Saskatchewan Employment Act, and the Emergency Planning Act. There are several others as well that come into play. And as mentioned earlier in this presentation, council is the decision maker, and the administrator is responsible for carrying out those decisions. Lastly, when it comes to discussing the roles and responsibilities, we also need to discuss the role of the public. Legislation gives the public some of their own powers to hold their elected officials accountable. The public has the right to attend and observe all meetings of council and council committees. They have the right to access certain municipal documents, such as minutes, bylaws, audited financial statements, contracts, accounts paid, and of course, the public disclosure statements. The right or the public has the right to petition. They can petition for a public meeting of the voters, for a referendum, and for special audits such as management or financial audits. The public also has the right to contact the Saskatchewan Ombudsman if after attempting to resolve their concern with council, they feel that they were still treated unfairly. On to our next section, we'll discuss procedures, decision making, council procedures bylaw, and closed sessions. Something that we hear often about is the use of email or text messages to make decisions in between meetings. Please don't do that. <laughs> that would be contravening the legislation. The reason for that is because all decisions have to be made in a duly called public meeting and they have to be made by either resolution or a bylaw. Now, in most cases, emails and text messages are, they tend to be on the administrative or the operational side of things. So if that is the case, perhaps in advance, council should decide to establish a policy 
Of course, that policy would have to be passed by a resolution or bylaw. And that would provide direction to your administrator in dealing with certain matters should they, should they come up without having to worry about getting council together to make a decision each and every time. This not only complies with legislation, but it also provides transparency, consistency, and fairness to the public. It's also more efficient. Many of you may be familiar with parliamentary procedure, or maybe you've heard of Robert's Rules of, excuse me, Robert's Rules of Order, uh, maybe from some experience you had on other boards or committees. Well, municipalities have a similar concept, and it's in the form of a council procedures bylaw. This bylaw goes even above and beyond in establishing rules for conducting business during their meetings. All council members should be very, very familiar with their council procedures bylaw, and we recommend that this bylaw be handy for reference at every single meeting that happens. Let's talk about closed sessions. Sometimes closed sessions are referred to as in-camera sessions or in-camera meetings. So closed sessions are closed to the public. They're used only for matters that concern long range or strategic planning or matters that are covered under the privacy legislation. Closed sessions are used for discussion purposes only no decisions or resolutions can be made during a closed session. Discussions held during a closed session are confidential. So you want to keep in mind that governance, dialogue, ought to be visible to the community that is served. It's always better to err on the side of openness and transparency. Consider establishing rules for closed session deliberations and reporting results. Those can be established and put in your council procedures bylaw, which we talked about before. Confidentiality is important to good governance, but secrecy will weaken it. There's a strong argument that closed sessions should be used only in extraordinary circumstances, because council is expected to act in an open and transparent manner. So we are nearing the end of, of my presentation. Please know that there are many, many, many resources that you can find all over the place, uh, particularly on the internet, about good governance. And that will help you be the best elected official for your municipality that you can be. I've listed just a few of the resources that are available. I assume that you'll have um, access to a printout of this presentation. So if you wanted to see that list later, I'm sure it will be available to you. All right. So general elections for 2020, they're just around the corner. You guys are all getting geared up for it. Nomination day will be October the 7th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And remember, public disclosure statement has to be attached and form part of your nomination papers. Those nomination papers can be dropped off prior to October 7th during regular office hours. Election day is going to be held on Monday, November the 9th from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Of course, the returning officer may decide to open a little bit earlier if they so choose. Um, in the future, election days will be held on a Wednesday, but this year, uh, the Wednesday happened to fall on Remembrance Day, so it was moved two days earlier to Monday, November the 9th. Municipalities must have one or more advanced polls and may choose to offer a mail-in ballot system. So our office is also here to help you. Here's our contact information. You are certainly welcome to contact us anytime with any questions uh, that pertain to the legislation. And we will be happy to give you whatever technical advice we can provide.
Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Judy. That was a great presentation. I definitely found it informative and uh, I hope everyone in our audience today did as well. Uh, for those of you that are listening in via phone audio, I see we have eight of you. Uh, as Judy mentioned, there will be a recording of this PowerPoint sent to you as well, a, uh, the copy of the slides so that uh, you can see everything that you weren't able to visually see today. Uh, we're now going to move into the Q&A portion of the presentation. So I want you all to take a couple of minutes to submit your questions in the Q&A box. Please note that the questions in the chat box are not going to be read by us. And if you see a question in the Q&A pod that you think should be asked that you don't want to ask again, uh, you can give it a thumbs up uh, underneath the, uh, the question uh, to get it raised to a higher status. Uh, the questions with the most thumbs are going to be the ones that we ask first. So if you think the question is very important to be asked, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Um, reminder that if you have questions for existing counselors or questions on day-to-day -day duties and responsibilities, uh, we're going to ask you to save those for your corresponding city, town, or village session coming up next week. Uh, and without further ado, we're also going to invite, invite our sponsor, Brownlee, uh, Michael, back onto uh, the video so that he can also offer some advice on the presentation. So it looks like our first question, which has quite a few thumbs up, I will post to you, Judy. Question for the presenter regarding council member as an employee or acting as an employee. The acting as an employee part seems to happen often helping with maintenance on certain assets, et cetera. What is the rationale for the legislative blanket prohibition? And what do you practically say in those situations? Uh, well, we practically say that, first of all, um, yes, it is in the legislation. It specifically has a clause in the legislation saying that a council member cannot be an employee. Uh, basically, you can't be an elected member and an employee. That is considered two different, um, two different positions entirely. I think there's a, um, a definition in the Saskatchewan Employment Act that talks about um, acting as an employee, which could be even acting for, for no pay, so like a volunteer. Uh, it, it often can just get people in trouble um, elected officials are not usually the ones that do the work, they make the decisions, the employees do the work and carry it out. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Judy. Uh, Michael, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, uh, legally there would be concerns, um, not only as Judy said, is it contrary to the legislation, um, but as a municipality you have obligations uh, under things like the occupational health and safety legislation to ensure that work is being carried out to appropriate standards, that work is being done uh, by trained individuals. Um, so there can be issues around municipal liability if councillors are, are undertaking tasks that they're not allowed to do, not trained for, not equipped to do. Practically, the other concern is, as Judy says, that council as a body are the decision maker. And the staff admin in administration operationalize or carry out council's decisions. If individual councillors uh, get involved in operations, you're, you're mixing the roles and responsibilities, which can add to a lot of issues around lack of role clarity. It can run into situations where individual councillors are intentionally or otherwise uh, purporting to give instructions to municipal employees, which they can't give, or to give instructions to contractors that were retained by the municipality. So it's important that councillors stick to the role that they were elected to uh, carry out, which is to make policy decisions, uh, pass bylaws and resolutions on behalf of the municipality, and leave operations to the staff that you've hired or contracted to do that work and that those roles, um, everybody stays and plays in their own sandbox. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Um, I do see that uh, we have someone with their hand up. Uh, unfortunately, with the number of questions we have, we're not going to be able to take any live questions. So uh, if your hand is up because you have a question, we just encourage you to put it into the Q&A pod uh, and we'll address it after if uh, we get to it. 
Our next question, I heard that there's a new law being put in place where council could remove a counselor for breach of ethics uh, without taking it to court. Is this true, Judy? Uh, well, yes, it is. Uh, you want to make sure that you use this sparingly. This is not meant to be abused. Um, sections 147 and 148 of the Municipalities Act work hand in hand together. Uh, what those two sections talk about is disqualification of members of council. Section 147 um, outlines all the various reasons why a council member may potentially be disqualified. 148 talks about the enforcement of that disqualification. Now here's the new part that you're talking about in legislation. It says that a council, or first of all, if a member of council is disqualified, they're supposed to resign immediately. But if they don't resign immediately, the new um, clause in legislation says that council may, by resolution, declare the person's office vacant. The onus is then on that person whose office was declared vacant to go to the courts within 10 business days to try to fight that. Perfect. Uh, thank you. And Michael, if at any time you have anything to add, just jump in. Uh, but if not, we're going to move on to the next question. Our next question, I understand that no decision via text or I understand no decisions via text or email. This does happen in contravention with the Municipalities Act. Sometimes decisions innocuous, uh, such as a food truck wants to come for a weekend parade, may not be covered by bylaw or policy and a meeting for the item is unintendable. What mechanism can be used uh, when a couple of text messages could, uh, do, could do for, uh, for the allowance of the food truck or a similar situation? One of the risks that council members take in that particular case is decisions can be made very quickly by text or by email um, after they give their decision by text or email, council may uh, obtain more information that may change their mind. And when it comes to the next council meeting where they have an opportunity to make a decision or a resolution to, uh, to ratify that decision, what if a council member or more than one change their mind and say, you know, I had a chance to think about it and um, I'm sorry I sent that text or that email. I don't agree with it anymore. Technically, a resolution or would be required in that respect. And maybe a special council meeting could be held on very, very short notice to deal with that. I know you say that it's uh, not tenable or untenable to have a council meeting, but council meetings can be held in very, very short order if, if need be. And Sean, to that, I'd just add that, you know, the the question raised the fact that there's no bylaw or policy in place. And of course, from a best practices perspective, um, council should be acting proactively, forward thinking, and have bylaws and policies in place, including uh, delegations of authority to the administrator uh, for further subdelegation to staff in the organization, as opposed to council meeting to make ad hoc decisions on a one-off basis time after time. Um, like it or not, local government at the municipal level is uh, the most open and transparent form of government and you have legal obligations to hold your meetings in public. So uh, even if all of council can get together over text, um, that's not a public meeting if the public uh, does not have prior notice and the opportunity to observe council's proceedings. So um, minimally, if a council decision is required, then the special hearing, uh, pardon me, special council meeting can be called uh, on, on very short notice as Judy alluded to. Perfect, uh, thank you. The next question, what type of family would be considered a conflict of interest? Can a sibling be on council and another one be an employee of the municipality? Okay, so the Municipalities Act considers uh, family under, for conflict of interest to be immediate family members. That would include a spouse. Um, it would include uh, dependent children. It does not include extended family members, such as uh, brothers and sisters. However, in saying that, 
the uh, ombudsman's office does take a look at extended family members as potentially being uh, family members that would be in conflict of interest. So something to keep in mind is perceived conflict of interest. And that's actually quite huge. If the public believes that a council member has a conflict of interest because they are making decisions for uh, maybe dealing with a brother's company, sometimes it's better to just step back, declare a conflict of interest, and leave the room. And don't have anything to do with that decision. In the long run, it's going to be better for you. It is going to um, probably have the public have more trust in you and more confidence in you if you remove yourself from that type of a situation. And really the rest of council, they can make a decision, one decision without you. So leave the room and come back when they're done discussing it. And if I understood the correct uh, question correctly, there, unless your, your municipality has a uh, no nepotism policy, if it has internal policies around hire, hiring of family members, uh, there would be nothing wrong with an elected official having a family member that works for the municipality. What Judy is referring to is the conflict of interest when a matter comes before a council or a council committee uh, where you would have to declare a conflict. And the Municipalities Act refers to uh, family as Judy alluded to, but there's still what we call the common law. That is all of the judge-made law, the case law that's, that's um, in existence in Saskatchewan and, and at the Supreme Court of Canada across the country that looks at conflicts of interest more broadly than just what the Municipalities Act uh, speaks to. And though, if you go on the Ombudsman's website and look at some of the public reports, the most common issue in my, my experience that they deal with with municipal councils is conflict of interest. And they've been very clear that the Municipalities Act um, doesn't change the rules around common law conflict of interest and that councillors have to look both at the act and also the case law to determine when a conflict occurs. And so the scope of conflict is much broader. Um, and, and most people without being legally trained, they know it when they see it. And, and my standard advice uh, without having to write you a lengthy legal opinion is to say, if you have any doubt, then declare and get out you're always better to uh, state that you have a conflict and avoid um, the repercussions, even if there may be some kind of legal argument that can be made on the back end to, to support you. It's not worth the grief uh, of dealing with the, the political fallout. I don't see the question on my screen anymore, but I believe there was a second or a third question in that same movie before. Um, so that it was just, uh, it's the question at the top, Judy, um, from this one, but I, I think we fully answered it. Um, we might get okay. to the one that you're referring to down below. I just don't see that one. Uh, I'm going to bundle the next two questions together though. Uh, are criminal, cri are criminal record checks required by September 4th, uh, 2020? And also, uh, where can I find my nomination forms? Okay. Um, okay, so here you caught me a little bit off guard. I can't remember the deadline for the criminal record checks. But first of all, not every municipality requires that criminal record checks uh, be completed and submitted with your nomination paper. That is not in legislation as a mandatory item. Um, each individual municipality can choose themselves whether or not they require a criminal record check. They would have to pass a bylaw if they do require that. Um, but I'm sorry, without looking, which may take me a little while, I cannot remember the deadline for passing that bylaw. And when it comes to the nomination papers, you can get your nomination papers from your municipal office, of course, or any municipal office for that matter. You can download them yourself off of the internet from the Saskatchewan Publications site. Just keep in mind that the public disclosure statement that must be filed with the nomination paper has to be the public disclosure statement form or the version of that particular form that your particular municipality uses. That's not a prescribed form. You cannot go to your neighboring municipality and get their public disclosure statement and use it with your nomination paper in a different municipality. 
Uh, different municipalities may have made some modifications to their public disclosure statement, so you want to make sure you get the one for the municipality you are planning to run as a council member for. Oh, oh okay. and does it say? I think I'm looking ahead. Sorry, at the next question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I was just going to add that uh, we can certainly find out that date for you after the fact and uh, we'll make sure it's included in the email that goes out with the recording of this uh, so that uh, you folks have that date uh, easily accessible for yourselves. Uh, the next question, as uh, I see you probably saw, Judy, uh, can I have a brief explanation of how nominations and voting works? Do I vote for one person to be on council or multiple votes for councillors in different specialities? Okay, so let's use a sample municipality. Let's say we have a municipality with one mayor and four council positions. There might be three people running for mayor and there might be five people running for the four council positions that are available. When you go to the poll, you will vote for one mayor out of the three that are on the ballot and you will vote for up to four council members out of the five names that are on the ballot paper. Now, the reason I say up to four, that particular municipality has four, but if you decide to vote for only two or three, for whatever reason, maybe you don't, uh, don't know the other people whose names are on the ballot, or you don't particularly care for those people and decide you don't want to vote for them, but you can vote for up to four. If you happen to vote for all five names that are on the ballot, that ballot will be rejected and none of your votes will count. And, what was uh, uh, and, and sorry, Judy, just to add on to that, because uh, I, I find this interesting as well. Um, for our cities that are divided into wards, um, is the voting, you're voting for the mayor and then also picking one candidate for the ward? That's correct. For just the ward where you are eligible to vote, again, who knows how many names may be on the ballot for that particular ward councillor, you will just vote for one ward councillor in the wards. Thank you for reminding me about the ward election system. Perfect. Uh, our next question is, what happens when a maintenance employee was fired and a council member fills in until a new hire is found? And I, this, I don't know, this might be a question more for Michael than it is for Judy. It kind of goes back to that question we had near the beginning. Um, Michael, you spoke about the ramifications a council member could be under for acting as an employee. I, I think maybe I'll leave this to you to repeat. Sure. Yeah, um, if you've got a, a gap there in your, your main and staff, um, you don't want to be hiring a counselor um, even as a temporary employee, because uh, as Judy said at the outset, you cannot be um, both an elected official and a municipal employee. Um, counselors can provide services to a municipality under contract, but again, there's, there's rules around that and, and disclosure requirements. I'd strongly recommend that counselor not be attempting to fill any municipal employee role uh, even when you have a gap, if you need to look at um, talking to your administrator to get assistance from a neighboring municipality, there may be an opportunity to enter into a contract for services where you could have um, someone else come in and fill in on a temporary basis, but I'd strongly recommend against any elected officials assuming employee-like duties on behalf of your municipality. I'm just going to interject quickly. Oh, yeah, the absolutely. criminal record checks that we talked about earlier, um, I did find what the deadline is. Uh, the legislation, and this is under the Municipalities Act, states that a bylaw to require criminal record checks of candidates has to be passed at least 90 days before the day of a general election. So it's 90 days. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Judy. And so bearing in mind that we did have this scheduled to end at 7.30 and we have lots of questions left, um, would you folks mind going just a little bit over time? Perhaps we could push to eight. If not, um, we can certainly end at the scheduled time, but uh, I will give you to the option. Um, I can stick around for sure. Yeah, it's fine with me. Perfect. 
Uh, our next question, you gave examples of what a municipality can't do, uh, acting as a natural person. Can you give examples of what a municipality acting as a natural person can do? Okay. Um, I'm trying to come up with a specific example. Um, in Section 8 of the Municipalities Act, it talks about um, bylaws that a municipality can pass. And it's pretty vague. It talks about, oh, I would like to go there if I can quickly, that a municipality can pass a bylaw establishing um, only certain activities can be done. But it doesn't say what those activities are. So council has a pretty broad um, pretty broad ability to pick out what abilities they may decide to restrict or not restrict because it doesn't state um, exactly what type of activities can or cannot occur. Not sure if Michael can think of any yeah. other examples. So I, I, I've got that question on the screen. I believe what the question is, is what can a municipality do acting as a natural person? Uh, and the short answer is, is anything that you and I can do as natural persons. That means that we can sue and be sued. That means that we can buy and sell land, that we can enter into contracts for goods and services. Those are the types of things that um, um, a municipality can do under its natural person powers. The, the things that are unique to municipalities as governments are those things that only governments can do, which is, as Judy said, passing bylaws, um, levying taxes, things of that nature. Uh, perfect, our next question part has been partially asked already, so I think I'll just see if I can uh, summarize what the second part is, but it's, um, uh, what do nomination papers encompass and what is the process of nominating yourself? Um, and of course, you can pick up nomination papers, as Judy alluded to, at uh, a municipal office. Okay, so what did the nomination papers encompass? The nomination paper that you have to complete, now I don't have one in front of me, but if I remember correctly, it of course is going to ask for your name, your address. Um, it is going to ask for which particular position you are planning to uh, run for, whether it's mayor or councillor. It is going to say that you are qualified to be a candidate to run in the election, uh, which basically is you uh, have to be a Canadian citizen, you have to be 18 years of age or at least, uh, you have to be a resident of the urban municipality that you are running as a council member for. Uh, you cannot be disqualified as a result of um, a conviction under the Criminal Code of Canada. You must have that nomination form uh, witnessed by, okay, now here's a difference. Uh, it, it may be five people in a city. There is uh, a larger number of people required to have as signatures or witness signatures on your nomination form. As the candidate, you have to accept that you are willing to run as a candidate for the election. Uh, what am I missing? Sorry, I wish I had that form directly in front of me. I could tell you exactly what it says. Um, again, the nomination papers, the public disclosure statement has to be accompanied. It actually forms part of the nomination papers, as well as a criminal record check, only if your municipality requires that. I think there was a second part to that question. Uh, and so it says, can you nominate yourself was the oh, second no, part. no, you cannot nominate yourself. You're going to sign the form and you're going to um, have your nominator sign it as well. Perfect. Uh, our next question, if a member of council forgets to declare a conflict of interest at the very beginning of the discussion and doesn't leave, but does not speak on the topic and tells you about the conflict after the fact, how would you note this in your minutes? If they make a note after the fact that they have a, a conflict of interest in that matter, uh, the administrator is required to note all declarations of conflict of interest in the minutes. 
So anybody that reads the minutes is going to see the notation that was made by the administrator regarding the declaration of that conflict of interest. And again, if, if, um, if you didn't declare it at that meeting, then you should be doing that at the next uh, meeting to make sure that you, you get that in the minutes. Uh, make it clear. And obviously, one of the things all counselors want to think of is when you when the minutes come forward at the next meeting for adoption, um, if you declared a conflict at that previous meeting, make sure that you actually review the draft minutes and ensure that your conflict was noted. And if it wasn't, that you ensure that the appropriate um, corrections to the minutes are made before they're adopted by council. Those minutes are an official record and they're your best evidence in the event of a court challenge. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, our next question, in camera, if decisions cannot be made, firing of staff is then a public discussion? Uh, well, no, the discussion can happen in an in camera session. In fact, it should happen in an in camera session. Any type of human resource matters should be held in an in camera session or a closed session. Just no decision can be made. So once the discuss discussion has been made, you will come out of the closed session back into an open regular session and a motion must then be made to fire that employee if that's, if that's what needs to happen and vote, the council will then vote on it. I just add two things. With respect to the motion arising out of in camera, um, we, we have obligations to protect personal privacy under the LA FOIP legislation. And so in some cases, the motion passed by council uh, may not include specific details uh, of which disclosure in public could breach privacy or other confidentiality obligations. So there's ways of wording those motions to adopt um, decisions um, from the in-camera discussions without disclosing that confidential information. The broader question is, is Judy mentioned that there's more than one organizational chart out there and your municipality makes those decisions locally. But um, in many cases, council, um, given that the administrator typically has control over the staff uh, under him or her in administration, council should only be looking at HR decisions involving employees that actually report to council. Um, that may be different in your municipality, depending on how your org chart's set up, uh, but one of the, the leading practices that we often speak to with clients is, is that the decisions around hiring and firing of staff below the administrator level um, should be dealt with administratively by the administrator, and that the administrator is then accountable to council uh, for those decisions. But again, uh, different, different municipalities have different org structures out there. Our next question, has education been offered for bias or perceived bias? It is an emerging trend in the world of governance and regulation. Conflict of interest is always highlighted, but this is also another important area. I'm not aware of any education necessarily being offered uh, by that. I know from personal experience that at past uh, SUMA conventions, for example, there have been presentations made by the Saskatchewan Ombudsman. And in that presentation, there was discussion about perceived uh, bias for conflict of interest. I don't know if they have ongoing training for that or not. I imagine there would be consulting firms out there as well that would be willing to provide that training. And our office uh, provides uh, new council orientation and council governance training uh, in which we talk about bias, both from the concept of the legislative decision-making process of council and, and what, what the courts call the closed mind test that you have to maintain an open mind uh, when you're sitting in council as a, a legislator making decisions of broad public policy. And then in the context of councils acting in what they call an adjudicative capacity where you're making decisions around the interest of individuals 
you're deciding appeals um, of, of matters that have been brought to council for review, then it's the reasonable apprehension of bias test, which is a higher standard of um, uh, requirement that counselors are acting in a more judge-like capacity and, and have to ensure that there's no uh, apprehension of bias in their decision making. Thank you, and uh, yeah, good. Uh, thank you for highlighting our uh, our convention, Judy. Uh, we do appreciate the shout out. Um, so for those of you that are going to be lucky enough to actually win your election and become a council member, uh, a couple of things I'll just quickly highlight. Uh, we do offer uh, municipal, municipal leadership development courses uh, called the MLRR program, as well as we do uh, often have a uh, council efficiency and uh, organization course uh, or education session at our annual convention. So. Uh, if you end up becoming a counselor, we uh, would invite you to come join us this February at our virtual convention uh, where you can find out more about uh, the uh, responsibilities of a counselor and uh, some of the things that you need to know as you prepare for your first year uh, on council. Our next question, how large or what role of a role does an administration play in ensuring elected officials and staff stay in their own sandboxes? Well, the administrator's role is to advise council about legislation, what it says in the legislation, and of course, to remind them of any policies that they have in place. Um, when it comes to staff, um, it's always a good idea to have job descriptions for every employee and every position that you have. So hopefully the staff is staying within their job description as it's, as it's listed. Um, again, it will depend on the organizational chart and who's responsible for um, uh, everything to do with the, with the employees, whether it's just reprimand, uh, let, in, uh, let a council member, or sorry, the employees know or remind them of what their roles and responsibilities are uh, according to their job descriptions. Now, the role that an elected official has, besides the administrator advising them according to legislation and any policies they have, uh, certainly fellow council members could perhaps uh, talk about what their roles and responsibilities are on a regular basis, just as a reminder to each other. Yeah, I'd just add that um, as as much as the administrator is council's chief advisor, letting them know about their uh, legislation policy and the obligations they have, it's important to note that ultimately the administrator is council's employee. And so one role that the administrator does not have is in any way, shape or form attempting to discipline members of council. Uh, councillors are accountable to the public uh, primarily at the ballot box. They're accountable to the ministry as a, a, a delegate of the, the province. And they're accountable to one another under the council code of conduct bylaw. And if there are counselors that are stepping outside of their roles and responsibilities or breaching uh, their, their code, then a complaint can be raised. And through the complaint process, councils established under that bylaw um, the matter can be investigated and corrective action taken if necessary. Uh, but council governs itself and holds one another accountable uh, and ultimately the public. Um, but administrators work for a council and do not um, interfere or attempt to um, discipline councillors. Uh, thank you both for that. Oh, sorry, I just clicked on a wrong button. Um, let me just Close that one out. Our next question. If a counselor were to own a company in which the municipality decides to contract out for a service which they provide, would that be considered a conflict of interest? Uh, yes, it absolutely would be. For one thing, if the counselor owns the company, the counselor would have reported that company on their public disclosure statement as having an, an interest in that business. And as I said before, anything that is listed on your public disclosure statement is a conflict of interest. So as soon as you know that that particular matter is going to be discussed before the discussion begins, that council member uh, should be declaring a conflict of interest 
following those five steps that I talked about before and ultimately leaving the room and not coming back until the discussion is over. Our next question, um, what sort of liability does council have? Uh, and they give an example of an RM that had overspent and needed to increase its taxes for the next year to catch up with its budget deficit. So liability is a funny, <laughs> a funny thing to answer. Um, sometimes you don't understand what liability is until it goes before a judge and the judge will determine how much liability anybody has. Uh, if a council has made a resolution or a decision, for example, about taxes, they've established what their mill rates are for the year and all other tax uh, rates using any tax tools, individually they would not be responsible because as a whole council, they made that decision by resolution of council. The legislation gives the ability for council to establish their tax rates. Um, maybe on the liability side, Michael, I hope you have something more on liability that you could add to that. Sure. So just, we need to distinguish between uh, council liability and personal liability of councillors. So uh, the municipality as a corporation may be found liable in, for example, negligence. Um, you know, if you fail to maintain a road properly and there was an accident that was caused or contributed by the lack of road maintenance, liability can attach to the municipality for that. Council as a governing body, uh, most decisions of council are immune from liability by what we call the policy defense. Um, the courts don't intervene on a legitimate policy decisions that are made by elected officials acting in good faith in the course of their duties. Individual counselors, however, can be found liable um, if they are acting in bad faith. For example, defamation um, is an example of bad faith. Or if they're acting outside of the scope of their duties. So for example, a counselor um, that wanted to just help out during a snowstorm and jumps on the grader to go clear the road and then ends up, you know, running into a vehicle. Well, that, that's not their role. They weren't trained for that. They weren't equipped for it. They're acting outside of their duties as an elected official. Uh, counselors can also be held liable for um, expenditures that they make that were not properly authorized by council. Um, or for spending money that was borrowed for a purpose other than which it was borrowed for. Um, so for those types of things, uh, counselor could be held personally liable. It's, it's extremely rare. And for those of you looking to run for counsel, I want to say very clearly that there are significant um, protections, both under the common law and under statute that elected officials are protected from personal liability for things they do in good faith. You don't have to be an expert. Um, you know, you can make the wrong decision as long as you're acting in good faith. And so if you're seeking the nomination to run for council, don't fear that you're gonna, you know, have to sell your house to pay your legal fees because you've been found liable for something while you're on council. If you join council um, to act in the public interest in good faith and, and do your level best on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you are unlikely to ever experience the wrong side of the law uh, or any personal liability for damages, okay? Uh, thank you, Michael. And uh, I, I'm sure that comes across as a, a big reassurance for people who uh, you know, are worried that they're gonna be out there and uh, get sued for uh, one wrong choice or, or acting in what they think is uh, the, the best interest of the community when uh, it's not. So it's good reassurance that there are protections out there. Uh, our next question, uh, as being a counselor is a part-time job, can a counselor have a full-time job as a government employee, specifically provincially or federally? Um, probably, um, absolutely. I would say that even the majority of council members out there in urban municipalities um, have full-time jobs. 
there may be sometimes um, if you work for a company that has their own internal policies that uh, maybe require their permission to run for an elected official um, or prefer that you don't, uh, that may come into play. But the most part, um, absolutely, you can have a full-time or part-time job and still be a council member. Uh, being a councillor, I wouldn't necessarily even consider it as a job. You're an elected official. Uh, you're a politician of a level of government. Perfect. Uh, and thank you for that. Uh, our next question. Can council assume control over the hiring of new staff from the administrator? Uh, yes, they can. So the legislation says that the administrator is responsible for the hiring, suspension, and dismissal of um, employees unless council has directed otherwise. So they need to make uh, a policy by resolution um, establishing that they will be responsible for uh, looking after the hiring, dismissal, and firing of, of employees. But if that doesn't happen, it's the administrator's job automatically. Uh, our next question, do you retain the staff from the previous, I, I'm assuming they mean council, who was in this position, or do you have to hire them yourself once elected? So counts, uh, the municipality is a continuing corporation and council is a, what they call a continuing body. So the individual members of council change uh, every election uh, or by-elections that occur, but the municipality carries on. All of the um, liabilities and contracts and assets of the municipality carry forward. Each time there's a new council, uh, you don't have to rehire staff or re-sign contracts. Everything that existed the day before the election carries forward. As the new council, however, you, you now are in a position of making decisions. And so um, unless a decision is somehow reversible or is going to result in, in a great de deal of liability and damages by, uh, by your council, if you break a contract, you, you have the right to make policy decisions on a go forward basis, which may mean, um, you know, reviewing someone's employment and whether you want them to continue with the organization uh, under, under your leadership or not. Uh, perfect. Our next question is, does the administrator attend in-camera sessions? Well, that's really up to the council. I would say in most cases, the administrator does but council can decide who attends the closed session and who does not. Now, of course, if the administrator is being discussed, uh, maybe some sort of a human resource matter, uh, then that does become um, something that council again may decide the administrator should not be involved in that discussion unless they want to hear specific information from the administrator and have, have the administrator attend. So it's really up to council. Yeah. So other than um, matters involving the, the administrator's employment and performance, the other example where um, I would see the administrator not attending is pot potentially uh, during the course of a, a code of conduct complaint uh, involving a counselor, where there may, depending on the investigation process set up in your bylaw, if counsel is investigating and dealing with that amongst itself, um, Council may or may not um, have the administrator present for that. Otherwise, um, our, our standard advice is that the administrator, the default position should be that your administrator is there in attendance for the simple reason that they are your principal advisor and they're in the position to provide you with information and advice. You're the decision maker, but you need to make informed decisions. You've hired an administrator, for the role of, of assisting you and providing advice. Um, so why would you not want them there present to offer their services? Um, councils that are routinely meeting without their administrator, that's in my experience usually a sign of some dysfunction, um, okay? So there are good exceptions to the rule, but as a general rule, I'd strongly advise you to have your administrator present there. That's what their role is. 
Thank you. And uh, being that we look like we only have about 10 minutes left, uh, I just want to encourage everyone to look in the Q&A pod and give a thumbs up to a question that you'd really like to ask because uh, we're only going to have time to ask a couple more. Uh, our next question, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I think they're talking about remuneration, not renunciation, but it says, how was council renunciation set or reviewed? Okay, I assume that as well, that they mean remuneration. Uh, council remuneration is set by council themselves. Uh, so they can decide to uh, set their remuneration, how they are going to be paid uh, once a year. Uh, they can uh, leave it for the entire year. They can perhaps set the remuneration for a six month period of time. It's really wide open for them to decide how that remuneration and how much that remuneration is to be paid. Now, the only thing to keep in mind when a council does decide to uh, set the remuneration, or change the remuneration from the last time it was discussed, they will have to provide public notice that the next council meeting is going to be discussing council remuneration. And, and this is an example of the exception to the conflict of interest rules. So clearly, individual counselors have a financial interest in, in how much money they make, how they're, how they're compensated for being on council, but it's a, an exception to the rules that allows council to make decisions regarding their own remuneration, much in the same way that you set tax rates or uh, municipal utility uh, charges that you may be paying uh, as a resident yourself. Uh, our next question is regarding eligibility. Do you have to be a resident of the municipality or is owning property in the municipality sufficient to allowing you to run for office even if you live elsewhere? You must be a resident to be a candidate in an election for a village, a town, or a city. Now, this is a little bit different. For example, rural municipalities have different eligibility rules for, for candidates, but for cities, towns, and villages, you must be a resident of that municipality. Now, if you only own property and do not live there, you cannot be a candidate, but you may qualify as a voter for that municipality, just not a candidate. All right, um, and uh, I'm gonna take this one final question and then we're gonna wrap up. Uh, is nomination day uh, only one day? So do you only have that one day of nomination day to submit all of your paperwork? Well, we refer to nomination day as being one day. And of course that's October 7th uh, from nine till four only. However, nominations can be accepted prior to that during regular office hours. Typically it will state in the notice of call for nominations that nominations will be accepted. Uh, from the time that it's advertised until nomination day during regular office hours. So there is quite a large window there for people to be able to get all the paperwork uh, completed and hand it back in. Perfect. Well, that, uh, that brings us to all the time we have for questions. Uh, I do want to give uh, Judy and Michael uh, one last chance to just summarize uh, today's presentation and give any final words of advice. So. Uh, I guess we'll start with uh, Michael. Um, what do you think is the most important thing that uh, these candidates need to know as they look at running for election and then, you know, maybe possibly serving as a counselor uh, if they are successful? Well, I, first, I think it's important that you do your due diligence to know what it means to be a counselor, what the obligations are. Depending on your municipality, you're gonna to wanna to find out how often it holds council meetings, what council committees it has, so you understand the, um, the time commitment that's involved here. Um, there is quite often a great deal of time commitment required um, in this kind of public servant uh, position that you'd have as a, as a counselor. So make sure that you understand and are going into the process with your eyes wide open. It's a very rewarding position. It's an honor and a privilege, um, but it is a commitment and there are legal obligations that you need to comply with. Um, beyond that, understanding your role if you're elected is, is critical to your success as an individual counselor and collectively as a council. Um, my primary practice area is council governance 
and uh, the number of issues that arise due to a lack of understanding of our role and understanding that as counselors, we're there to serve the public interest, not our own personal interest or private interests of our family, friends, or business associates or acquaintances. Uh, if we understand uh, what we're there to do and what our job is, um, you're, you're going to be successful in your time on council and have opportunities to do great things to, to move your municipality forward and make it a better place to, to live, work, and play in. Yeah, I think that's excellently said, Michael. Um, uh, it, it's definitely, uh, when it comes down to it, you need to understand what you're getting yourself into when you choose to put your name forward for uh, municipal election and to be a, a possible council member or a mayor. So I think that's an excellent point. Uh, we'll move over to Judy. Judy, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share today or uh, uh, not, words of advice? But not a lot more. Um, Michael covered basically the same types of matters that we hear about on a regular basis. Um, again, we're here to help anybody. We take uh, questions from not only administrators, which a lot of people believe we are only serving. We we help elected officials and we also help the public. We get questions from them all the time. Uh, my advice would be, um, I guess just echoing what Michael has to say is be open, um, educate yourself, become knowledgeable, uh, attend training sessions wherever you can, uh, meetings, talk to neighboring communities if you happen to know some elected officials from there. Um, don't use closed sessions. Um, any more often that you have to. Um, I also have heard from a lot of people who have gone on to council for the very first time is that after they've been on, they've discovered that it's um, totally different than what they were expecting. And it was a real eye opener. And like Michael said, also a very rewarding experience. So I wish everybody good luck in the upcoming elections and we're here to help you if you have any questions. Well, thank you both again. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time and especially taking the extra half hour to uh, to take all the questions. I know we have uh, several left over and uh, what we'll do is we'll send them over to uh, Judy and to Michael and uh, I'll see if I can condense them down to make sure there's not duplicates uh, to see if we can get you folks some answers uh, after the fact here. I wanna thank you all for your great questions. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna be providing a recording of the presentation to all registrants in the next few days, as well as a PDF of today's PowerPoint. If you're interested in attending part two of this session, next week we have our city session, which is September 8th at 6.30, featuring counselors from the city of Melford, Yorkton and Regina. We also have our town session, September 9th at 6.30 PM, which is gonna feature the mayor of Nakam and a CAO from Winyard. And we have our village session, which rounds out our week on September 10th, which will feature the CAO, CAO from Elbow and a surprise counselor from a village in Saskatchewan, which we haven't quite locked down yet. Uh, please take a few minutes to fill out a short survey so we can improve our upcoming events uh, and improve this session. And I wanna thank you all for joining us. I know uh, it has kind of been a long session, a whole hour and a half, uh, but we hope that you found uh, value out of this uh, and we hope that we can see you at our next sessions next week. Uh, another huge thank you to our panelists, Judy and Michael. Um, the insight that you provided today is invaluable and I think it's going to help get all of our candidates off on the best foot as they look at running for the election. And I just wanna wish one final good luck to all of you. Uh, we wish you good luck on behalf of municipalities of Saskatchewan uh, in your election endeavors and uh, we hope to see you at our convention in February. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Judy and Michael, feel free to log off. We're just gonna keep the meeting open till we have uh, all of our panelist results, or all of our survey results, sorry.